Welcome to our live ORF event. I am Lisa. I'm the Reader Development Librarian for Suffolk Libraries. And today I am so delighted to introduce the brilliant and amazingly talented author, MJ Ardledge. Welcome, Matt. And thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's such a thrill. And um, you know, obviously you've got an extraordinarily successful career already, over 20 years writing for television. But what was it like when you got that very first book published? Oh, it was amazing, really. I, I sort of, in my TV career, I'd worked as a producer and a script editor, but I'd never quite been bold enough to write something myself and say, right, this is by me. Um, cause that's a sort of slightly scary thing to do. Um, so I decided that I would write a secret novel, which I did, uh, which was Eeny Meeny, the first one. And I didn't even tell my wife I was doing it. I just snuck the odd hour here and there and managed to cobble it together. Um, and then I got an agent and all the rest of it, but my, my most sort of clear memory of it, the most exciting bit is when I was walking through St Albans Market, which is where I live, and um, I got a phone call from my agent and they said that um, Penguin uh, had made an offer for it uh, and that I was going to be a published author. And you sort of, I always remember that moment, partly because just, wow, it's actually going to be published, which is amazing, but also by the fact that it was Penguin, which I thought my mum would be very proud of. And she, you know, that's sort of a world famous publisher. And I, uh, I, st I still sort of, it gives me a little tingle remembering that because it was just such an amazing moment. Was it quite surreal? And when you told the people that you kept it secret from, how did they react? Yeah, well, they were very excited. And, and um, I think, as I said, I, I, the reason I kept it quiet is because I think there are lots of people who say they're writing a, a novel and then you never quite see it or they never quite mm -hmm. finish it. So I didn't want to be one of those people. I wanted to just actually get something finished first and then at least have something to, to offer to people. Um, and then, yes, I ended up in this surreal situation where, you know, like, like a lot of authors, a lot of people rejected it. That's fair enough. But we had sort of, I think we had Penguin and Faber and Faber and a couple of others. And so that was quite fun that more than one publisher wanted it. So that was nice. Um, that was exciting. And so that then happened. And then and weirdly, sort of um, foreign publishers, France, Germany, so on, started buying it. And that all snowballed quite quickly. And, and you sort of thought, wow, it sort of, um, you know, this could be a, quite a life changing moment, really, if it goes well. And, and it did, because obviously you mean you went on to become the best-selling UK debut novel in 2014. What was that like? On top of the surrealness of the books published, you got an offer from Penguin, and now it's the best-selling debut novel as well. Yeah, that that was, I mean, what, what 2014 was just the most amazing year, because we were very lucky that it got picked up by the Rich and Judy Book Club. And I think that sort of triples your sales or whatever. Yeah, and, uh, and and so I remember, I mean, I, I had to, I went to meet them and at the Charlotte Street Hotel in London and I was sitting in the green room and, and this uh, they were interviewing a few people that day. Um, and I remember the, the production assistant coming up to me and saying, Rich and Judy are ready for you now, which I'll always remember as, as being highly amusing. And, and down we went and I, I met them and, and had a lovely chat with them. And then they were so kind because they, they sort of, did an amazing PR job for me, really. They went on this morning and they went on Steve Wright on Radio 2 and they just said, you know, we think this guy's the new Joe Nesbo, which was, you know, and I had people saying, look, this woman's talking about you on this morning. And it was, so that was very, very odd. And then the week that it came out, I remember that the sort of sales figures came through and the people at Penguin uh, all seemed slightly perplexed. I mean, in a nice way, they were like sort of astonished at, at how well it had done. And... And, and I remember them telling me that first week's figures and them saying, and they, they're saying, you know, this, this could be something really special. And, and yeah, and, and I think that's the thing. It was just very surprising that it landed with such a sort of, um, you know, with such success. But I, th I think a lot of that is down to the patronage and, and, and sort of enthusiasm of Rich and Judy, who really do a great job at promoting new authors. And, and you're absolutely right, you know, once they pick up the book, you know, I've interviewed Kate Morton and Lisa Joel, and the same thing happened to them. It just rocketed the awareness of the book. It's not that the book wasn't always fa already fabulous, it is, but it, it puts it in, in front of people in a way that's just amazing for an author. And obviously yeah. you introduced us to your amazing protagonist, Helen Grace, and we've had a, com a question before the event and just popped up now, where they've asked, where did the idea and inspiration come for that amazing character? <laughs> um, well, let's have a... Think. I mean, I think that I'm, I'm generally much more interested in writing female characters than male ones, because I think women are basically more interesting 
um, and uh, and certainly more complex. Uh, it, it, in, in a, in a, no, but in a good way. I mean, I think with my male friends, I pretty much know all the time what they're thinking. I think I think women are sort of more complex and possibly <laughs> more deep. Um, and and I think and also I just think female characters, as in as in real life, I think women have more obstacles to overcome generally in life, and that's that's good for your for your fictional character. And it makes makes for a, a richer world. Um, so I wanted to definitely. I knew I wanted to be female, and I wanted her to be quite a sort of um, quite an action chick in a way. I sort of think yeah. I, I wanted her to be sort of quite athletic, resourceful, always putting her body on the line, quite sort of fearless in a way, which I which I enjoyed. Um, but I wanted to try and avoid some of the cliches of sort of cop drama, so the sort of marital problems and the drink, you know, which is why she's sort of teetotal and all that sort of stuff. So I wanted to try and avoid that. And I just, my most overriding idea was I just wanted to make her interesting because I think, you know, uh, I always love the baddies in, in you know, it's it's a sort of, like in Star Wars, you like Darth Vader and Han Solo, but Luke Skywalker's a bit boring, you know, it's sort of, it's <laughs> often the hero, the, the heroes who are a bit sort of vanilla compared to the bad guys or the rogues. And um, and so I just knew I wanted to make her interesting. And I had a little sign above my computer that said, do not make your heroine boring. Um, and I think I was reading quite a bit of um, Elizabeth Salander, the, the girl with the dragon tattoo books at, at the mm. time. Uh, you know, she rides a bike as well and various other things and is quite sort of unconventional. And, and so I think she was sort of somewhere in the back of my head as I was thinking, well, how do we make this woman you know, credible, emotionally interesting, but also a sort of challenging heroine. And yeah, and so so Helen was the sort of result. And, you know, um, she's sort of become a, a friend of mine now, having spent many years together. And um, they perfectly on to your latest book, Matt, Truth or Dare, which is coming out on Thursday for those who catch up on YouTube, 24th of June. The book is officially out to purchase. And I've already been telling Matt, I absolutely loved it. It was completely gripping, just an extraordinarily well-written book. Matt, what could you tell our audiences a bit of a peek about what this book's about, your latest instalment? Hmm. Well, this is a slightly different one. It's on a sort of bigger, grander, more complicated scale than, than before. And the idea is that there's a sort of crime wave gripping Southampton, a sort of series of brutal and random murders that seem completely unconnected with completely different perpetrators. It's as if the city's sort of suddenly gone mad in, in the summer heat yeah. and there's this just sort of spree of, of, of random and brutal murders. Um, and even when Helen and Charlie and the gang start to sort of get some clues and some ideas of the perpetrators, they still seem to make no sense because the perpetrators seem to have no connection with the victims or indeed any, any motive for killing them. So it seems completely baffling. Um, and um, as, it, as it proceeds, it falls ultimately to Helen to work out that there might actually be some connection between these seemingly random events and that this madness is in fact very much the product of one person's deranged mind. My are own. You, <laughs> <laughs> um, are you happy to do a reading for the audience, Matt? Yeah, so um, I will read you just the first chapter, so as not to bore you, but um, it uh, takes place in a murky yard in Southampton. And so here we go, truth or dare, Chapter One. He didn't want to move, but he knew he had to. He had come too far, risked too much to back out now. Steeling himself, he crept forward, his eyes scanning the gloomy yard. If there was any movement, any possibility of being detected, then he would turn and run without a second thought. But there was nothing, no sign of life at all, so he pressed on. The porter cabin lay directly in front of him, lonely and isolated in the darkness. A dull glow crept from beneath the blinds, the sole indication that it was inhabited. Anyone stumbling upon this yard might easily have missed the anomaly. This was a place where things came to rot and die, a dumping ground for abandoned cars and household junk. Curiosity was not encouraged, the entrance gates were chained, and though he had snapped the padlock easily, he was sure no one else had been tempted to try. You wouldn't set foot in this place unless you had to, nor would you assume that a treasure trove of secrets lay just beyond the stained door of the porter cabin. The ground was littered with rusting exhaust pipes, empty packing cases and abandoned white goods. It would be easy to kick something in the darkness, alerting his victim. So he moved forward carefully, teasing his way through the detritus. In the distance, a siren wailed, startling a bird which took flight, squawking loudly, but he ignored it, grimly focused on the task in hand. 
reaching the porter cabin, he paused, pressing himself up against its filthy carapace, craning around to peer through the window. The glass was grimy, coated in bird mess and dirt, so his view was blurred, yet you could still make out the figure inside. Overweight, sprawling, a bottle of Jack Daniels clamped in his hand, Declan McManus slumbered on a tired sofa. McManus looked totally out of it, utterly at peace with the world, which seemed profoundly odd, given the grave danger he was in. Surely he wouldn't have been so relaxed had he known that his hiding place had been discovered, that someone else knew his secret. He counted silently to ten, wanting to be sure that McManus was asleep, then quietly stepped up to the door. Still there was no sound within, so reaching out a gloved hand, he turned the handle. His heart was thumping, his hand shaking as he teased it downwards. This was the point of maximum risk, when his approach was most likely to be detected, but the handle slid down easily. Cautiously, he eased the door open, preparing to cross the threshold. As he did so, however, the aged hinge started to protest, screaming out in alarm. Horrified, the intruder froze, uncertain what to do. Then acting on instinct, he yanked the door fully open. The hinge squeaked briefly, then was silent once more. Stepping inside, he cast an anxious eye towards the sleeping man, but McManus hadn't stirred, the near-empty bottle of bourbon having done its work. He closed the door, the sounds of the night suddenly dying away. Now it was just the two of them, cocooned inside this sad space. It was even more unpleasant and odorous than he'd anticipated, a fitting backdrop for the grubby individual in front of him. This was where McManus hid his spoils, conducted his business, brought young girls. He shuddered to think what had occurred within these four walls, but he was not here to dwell on past crimes. He was here to do a job, to do what was necessary. Many lives had been blighted by this man, but perhaps after tonight, he would do no more harm. Stepping forward, he looked down at the comatose figure. Part of him still expected McManus to rear up, wrapping his sweaty palms around his neck. But he lay still, undisturbed and unsuspecting. There was nothing stopping him, no imminent danger, no chance of detection. This was it. It was time to kill. There we go. End of chapter one. It's a brilliant opening, and I, I think you've got an extraordinary talent of really getting into the mind of would-be killers. And is that something that you find really fascinating, Matt, to, like, what would drive someone to commit a murder? Is, is that something that's interested you in your writing for TV and in your own books? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the crime is, is such a sort of diverse um, genre, really, because on the one hand, you can write about Hannibal Lecter and serial killers and really the sort of most disturbed minds who are sort of, you know, multiple killers. But you can also um, get inside the head of an ordinary person who's pushed into a, a, a crisis or an extraordinary situation and finds themselves taking another person's life. And I think that's I, I do find that endlessly interesting um, in terms of what would push you to do something that you know is, is, is harmful and morally wrong. That's, I think, ultimately what, you know, what interests us about crime. And I think it's no mistake or, or no sort of, yeah, it's no mistake that, that you know, that the, the countries that are most interested in crime fiction generally tend to be the safest. So it's sort of Scandinavia, Europe, UK, things like that, where actually generally we're all quite law abiding and we generally don't see murders or violence every day. We, in a funny sort of way, makes us even more fascinated by people who sort of transgress. Um, and I think it's that that idea of transgression of, you know, on the one hand, doing something quite minor like theft or something more aggressive like that, or the extreme end of the spectrum, which is keeping someone's head in a fridge or whatever. You know, it's that sort of um, moral transgression, which I think we find really fascinating, partly because we're all generally quite law abiding. So it's like almost the contrast, isn't it? Because we're, we're safe, you know, in comparison, we're a safe country and in Suffolk crime novels yeah, are so popular you know you'd yeah. think that we'd be the best people to like commit murder wouldn't you and yeah. you Matt when you're writing the books you'd be like mm, don't upset yeah. me I've got a perfect plan and exactly. you, you've already touched upon with Helen in this book there's, there's all these different crimes going on with no obvious suspect no obvious solution and I, I really felt for her and she's got her own challenges within her team as well and you are able to weave that plot together in a really extraordinary way now now with the sort of fascination of what ifs with people how do you come up with all these amazing ideas for your books and for the next one um well I mean there, there are two different things here there's Helen's own story which um 
generally I just like to throw as many rocks at her as I can and make life as sort of impossible for her you know as a can and just keep you know she's sort of quite a cursed character Helen she occasionally she sort of inches towards happiness but then you know it's all going to go sort of cat- backwards again catastrophically wrong and, and that sort of that that that's kind of the fun bit in terms of the other ideas I think that um particularly the, the sort of killers and the whole kind of plot element of it you know, really, those ideas come from anywhere and everywhere. You just you suddenly have this idea and you think, oh, that's kind of pleasingly unpleasant or that's quite sinister or, you know, that's really interesting. And I think very few of them come from research. I think there's like sort of a couple of the books that have been based on sort of real cases. Most of it just comes from a really random thought that just occurs when you're in the supermarket or, you know, walking the dog or whatever. Um, the, the example I always give is when I went... Um, the Doll's House, which is a quite a creepy one, which is the third book in the series. Um, that idea came to me when I, we were on holiday with another family um, uh, in Mallorca and all the kids wanted to sleep in the same room. But I knew that because they're quite young and I knew that one of them would wake up and then they'd all wake up and it would be a bit of a disaster. So once they were asleep, I would sort of creep in and I'd pick my daughter up and I would carry her and put her back in her own bed. Um, so she got a good night's sleep. And I remember as I, I was walking along doing this at one point and I realised that every night she went to sleep in one bed and woke up in a different bed, but never commented on it. Um, and I thought, wouldn't that be strange if you were a grown woman and you went to sleep in your own bed and you woke up somewhere else and, and how freaky that would be. And so I remember as I was carrying her, I thought, well, that's a nice idea, isn't it? You know, and, and the whole of the doll's house basically was spawned from that idea that occurred at, I don't know, midnight or something, you know, one evening. And, and um, those are often the best ideas. In, and they often come late, I think, sort of, or if, you're, if you can't sleep and it's 2 a.m. and suddenly this, in the darkness, this idea comes to you. And that's what I like about it, because they sort of just come um, unbidden, really. They just pop into your head. I love that. And obviously with your amazing series of um, Helen Grace books, it's set in Southampton and... Mm. Um, and Marie is asked, like she lives there and she thinks it adds another dimension for her to a lovely layer for her to read the books. But asked, like, why did you choose that as a location? Was it deliberate or, you know, was there a reason behind that? Well, it was two things, really. One, one sort of practical, which is that the problem with creating a, a, a new fictional detective is that because Brits have been doing crime fiction for, you know, years and years and years, um, a lot of towns and cities already have quite a famous fictional detective, you know, so you have to be quite careful where you set these things. Southampton didn't have its own um, super cop. So I thought, well, that, that's a sort of good, well, I'll grab Southampton. But then when I went down there to check it out, what I realised is that Southampton is a really interesting place because it's a port, basically. And mm-hmm. ports are interesting because all sorts of good, good and bad things come in and out of ports. And I think port cities have a very sort of unique um, atmosphere um, and also I quite like the idea Southampton was obviously massively bombed during the Second World War I think it's the most bombed place in um, in the UK which gives it quite an unusual identity and I thought again because Helen as a character has been sort of kicked from pillar to post from from day one in her life really I thought again that sort of slightly fractured city that's sort of fighting up was was quite a good sort of metaphor for Helen herself so it all sort of fitted well but it but it is mostly the port thing that interests me and I like going down there and wandering around the ports and all the sort of you know all the atmosphere and stories that present themselves when you do that and I've already been saying obviously how much I loved your latest book Truth or Dare mm. now one of the things that I thought was really brilliant was the ending it was really quite sinister and one of the things that sometimes happens because I read quite a, a lot of books especially we're doing so many interviews is a book that's incredibly gripping throughout doesn't always hit the mark at the end but you absolutely did that like I I was left with a bit of a chill by the end of the book and you know when you started writing it Matt did you know that's how you were going to leave us as the reader? Yeah no absolutely I mean I always start at the end and work back really you know what once I've had the initial idea of okay this could be fun then really for me it's all about the ending and because in my previous job, when I was a sort of producer for TV, I would always be reading crime books, trying to see, you know, is it going to be the next cracker or the next prime suspect? Can we adapt it? And you're right, a lot of them you read um, and you got to the end and it was a bit disappointing. And you sort of thought, well, that's a shame, isn't it? If you've read 400, 500 pages and you realise they didn't really know how to end it when they started. And I, I think that's a bit of a crime because it does take a long time to read a book. Um, and so you, you, you've got to do people the courtesy of having a good ending. Um, so I always, because I plan every chapter 
before I um, start writing. But I generally start at the end. And I think for me, because in a way, the end of a book, it, it's not just its climax in terms of the big action sequence or whatever happens, but it's also should be kind of the point of the book, you know, when everything's revealed. And then if you do have a little twist like I do in this one, which which I'm just about to follow up on in the next one, which is good fun, um, then, you know, it is fun. And I always remember if you can, usually I round it all off quite nicely. Sometimes I do leave a little cliffhanger. And, and I remember the end of Little Boy Blue where, where Helen ends up being frame for murder at the end of that and I remember people were quite shocked by that because it was not a sort of happy ending and they knew that uh, sort of the next installment where Helen would be behind bars in, in hide and seek would be uh, obviously very dangerous um, but that that's the sort of most outrageous cliffhanger I've done but I do like to occasionally throw those in just to keep people on their toes. It's absolutely brilliant and I, I agree with you you know like it, you can still really enjoy a book but some and a series as well obviously you works a lot on tv as mm. you've touched upon but mm. when you get to the end you go oh it's it's yeah. such a shame and, and you yeah, absolutely yeah. don't do that no, and um you. Karen has said that she absolutely loves the Grace novel series but she as well as Holly actually has asked about Silent Witness so BBC Silent Witness you mm. um, wrote several episodes for that so Karen wanted to know how did that come about how did you end up working on the show which is one of her favorites and Holly wondered where does the inspiration come from especially when there's established characters as a writer going in. Yeah, well, it's quite hard, actually, that. And I mean, in terms of how it came about, it's relatively simple. Is that I'd, 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 I'd obviously been working in TV for a long time. I'd had some of the books published. I think two or three of the Helen Grace books have been published. Um, and it was simply that I knew I wanted to try and write crime. And Silent Witness had been going for, I think John Major was Prime Minister when it first was broadcast or something. So it's been going that long. Um, uh, and it was a, such a, an interesting, well-established crime format. And quite juicy because you get to you know to do it in two episodes so it's quite a big it's almost like a feature film really and so i i asked to sort of meet the producers and we chat and we all got on well and that was nice um and the idea is where do they come from I, it just depends what was interesting me at the time and i think the very first one i did which i think was my best one and the one i really enjoyed was about um the russians in uh, london and oligarchs particularly and how there are lots of people who don't like their presence here and feel that in a way perhaps dirty money is being washed through London via all these properties that they buy and all the rest of it and that struck me as a really interesting world but also as a way of getting into a slightly glamorous world because often Silent Witness is quite sort of down and dirty and sort of quite gritty and all the rest of it and they had quite a lot of um, quite challenging sort of social realism sort of stories in that in the series the first one I did so I thought it'd be quite fun to provide you know a sort of the, the kind of penthouse version uh, and do and it was fun actually because I took my daughter who was how old was she she was sort of let me think she must have been about seven or eight and I took her on set to watch a little bit of the filming and to watch Amelia Fox and the others do their bit and um, work out how the body seemingly was killed here could have ended up there and I remember her coming away afterwards and her, her little mind was sort of fizzing about oh, well this could have happened or that could have happened and you know she was really enjoying the sort of mystery of it um, and it was it was great fun to do and I also the best bit about it was I got to go on set and lie down on one of the slabs where they normally chop people up so so that was good I quite enjoyed that I'm not sure <laughs> I'd like that at all um, <laughs> but so I guess it's it's your niche though isn't it Matt you know crime must have been quite thrill and um, yeah yeah Joanne has also asked, she's a big fan of Silent Witness and your books, but also Innocent, um, ITV's Innocent, which you're one of the co-creators and writers for that show. She's asked, and you touched upon then about watching it being filmed. What's that like, watching something that you've written being acted out and with a lot of hope? She's asked, are there any plans for the DC Helen Grace novels to be yeah. made in a to a TV series? Um well, I think, yeah, I mean, I've worked in TV for a long time and I think it is it is a very unique thrill when you're on set and, you know, it's often like 200 people there with all the electricians and the carpenters and the actors and the makeup. And it's a huge, huge sort of circus and it is exciting to sit that sit back and just think, actually, I, once upon a time I had an idea which then became a script, which then became a commission and then became this. And you see all it's these people. production. Yeah, it's, I mean, that is hugely exciting and Innocent was was brilliant I mean unfortunately on the second innocent which is the one that's just gone out I, I didn't get to see any of that at all because we filmed it during um sort of last year during Covid restrictions so we weren't allowed anywhere near the set and so we never met the actors we only met the director twice it was sort of very 
very unusual and and a very sort of odd experience that one but i was very pleased with the end product and it did amazingly well on itv and kat and kelly particularly uh kate kelly uh, who was the main actress in it was absolutely mesmeric i think brilliant um so yeah no it is huge exciting with helen grace you know i think definitely there's there's no sort of immediate plans for it. i think it would be great to do it at some point and at the right moment i think serial killers um particularly quite graphic ones like this go in and out of fashion and you have to pick your moment and i think because of all the events of last year and the sort of rather grim roll yeah. call of death you know, I think commissioning has been sort of in a slightly sort of lighter area, you know, um, and possibly slightly cosier crime. Um, but, you know, serial killers, they come and go. And when Helen's time is right, I'm sure she'll be there because I think she would make I think the books are quite cinematic and they've got a lot of action mm -hmm. in them. And she's an interesting female lead. Um, and I think, she, you know, it would be great. And I think I think, you know, I, I always remember shows like The Bridge where. You know, when you looked at Malmo and those places there and you saw the, the, the port and the, and the sort of lights twinkling, I definitely think there's a version um, of Southampton where we could kind of um, give it that sort of treatment. Have you ever found yourself wondering who you'd like to play her? Or is that somewhere that you've not gone in your own mind? Or do you see it like even with the shows you've been involved with and God, you know, they'd make a great Helen Grace? Oh, well, there are, there are lots of great actresses out there, definitely. And uh, I can think of five or six who would do it brilliantly. But I think, you know, the reality of it is, is that I think until you get there, you, you wouldn't really know. And then even if you did have your fancy cast, it would depend on who's available anyway. So, you know, yeah, there are certain practicalities. Yeah. But also, I mean, I think at this age, I, I generally don't say, because I think one of, one of the nice things about books is that, you know, you can offer up sort of hints about a character. And so, you know, I, I tell people what Helen does, you know, and we hear her speak, we know where she lives, which is, but I haven't really ever sort of described her physically, um, you know, in terms of hair colour or, or skin colour or anything, really. And it is always fascinating, therefore, when you talk to people and you do like a straw poll in a room of, of readers and say, you know, does she have blonde hair? Does she have black hair? Does she, you know, and, and the people who say she has blonde hair look at the other people as if they're mad because it's it, it's obvious to them that Helen has blonde hair. And then the people who think she's auburn or whatever, again, they look at the other people as if they're mad. And I think that's one of the, the lovely things about reading is that I'll give you a few prompts, but actually the Helen Grace that you create in your head will be unique to you and different yeah. to everybody else's. And that's what I find absolutely brilliant and wonderful about books. And so I, so I generally don't, say an actress because then you think oh, okay so she definitely looks like this and i and i'd rather not do that i'd rather just have hundreds of thousands of different helen graces wandering around i love that so like the, us as readers as you say create our own version of her this extraordinary yeah. feisty character and, yeah. and louise has asked about the series generally is there many more to come she is hoping for that so <laughs> are you planning to do many more of the series yeah well i'm literally as today, I'm just doing my chapter breakdown for the next one, um, which should be out, well, pretty much this time next year, I would imagine. Um, so, yeah, I'm hoping to do more. And I think um, as long as people keep buying them, I'll keep keep writing them. Um, and, you know, my hope is that, you know, recently, re you know, uh, male fictional cops like Rebus and Reacher and people like that, they, they went over the 20 novel mark. And I, I don't see any reason why Helen couldn't get there and we have a female crime fighter you know who gets to the 20 20 novel mark because I just I love writing them you know I find it I don't find it a chore I find it great fun and uh, and I think Helen's got lots of uh, life left in there and of course as you know there are dozens of serial killers in and around Southampton who need to be chased down so absolutely uh, so, yeah. and I think you know when we've talked about the stunning ending to truth or dare I'm really excited about the next one so I'm thrilled to hear that you're yeah. working on it it's on its way <laughs> it was it was truly sinister the ending where I was like oh my god um you know like what's next I need to read yeah, it yeah. come on yeah. Matt write it um, I will and one of someone else has also asked about your standalone Alison has asked about your standalone novels which you've only actually done one of and mm -hmm. she wondered is that something that you ever tempted to go back to to dip in between yeah I will do so so I'm going to write this next Helen Grace one and then I will just briefly pause to write a standalone because I think it does allow you just to do something slightly different so so the first one a gift for dying I did just had a slightly sort of supernatural element because I've always been interested about the idea of if if there was somebody who could tell you the, the day on which you died and exactly when you're dying how would you want to know 
Um, it's such a sort of interestingly unpleasant idea. And, and it surprises you because I, I absolutely wouldn't. I was like, no, please, I was just I'm happy to live in ignorance. But other people, it's like, yeah, of course I would want to know so I could plan my life and I could do this. And, and it brings out really interesting, um, but also just ask some interesting questions about whether your life is whether you, you have any freedom or whether your life is already preordained and all that sort of stuff. So it allowed me to explore some quite big issues, but also to set it somewhere else, because that was all set in Chicago and it had American characters. And I wrote it in American English, so I had to misspell everything, which was quite fun. And uh, um, and it was just great. I you know I went over there, sort of researched for a couple of weeks in Chicago, which was amazing. Um, so I think, you know, I think definitely I will probably... Helen, I think, will, will generally dominate because, you know, people like her and want her and I enjoy writing her. But I think every now and again, it's good for a writer just to pause and do something completely different. Still crime. It'll still be serial killers and all that sort of stuff, because that's what I like. But, but you know, just something a little different. And it's quite nice, isn't it, with the standalone novels, because you haven't got a bit like with the TV when you're going into Silent Witness. You don't have the established characters. You can start from scratch. You don't need to bring in all the historical things that you've already mentioned in the other series and make sure you you, you include it all. And um, I just another question from Susan. She wanted to know what are your your favourite TV shows? And I think you're a fan of the first series of True Detective, which I love as well, like Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson are brilliant in it. But um, is that is that are you a fan of that? And she's asked like, what other shows do you like watching? Yeah, no, I love that show. I thought it was incredibly. <laughs> I rewatched it the other day, and it's just it was just so seductive, and we, and I love the atmosphere of that, just being in sort of Louisiana and just being part of a world that to us as, as Brits seems very exotic because it's a bit weirdy woo and, and swamps and voodoo and all that sort of stuff, and you know we don't really have that here, and so that was very exciting. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I love lots of shows, really. It tends to be the darker stuff. I, I used to enjoy uh, Criminal Minds a lot and really going back, Wire in the Blood, Bell McDermott's one, I enjoyed that because, again, it had a sort of pleasingly uh, unpleasant uh, and sort of quite dark feel. Um, but then a lot of the stuff I really enjoy, I would say, is sort of, um, I guess, more sort of thriller movies, crime movies like... You know, Silence of the Lambs for me is still possibly the best just because I think, you know, the characters, but, you know, both both Clarice Styling and Hannibal Lecter is sort of so interesting and unique. And again, that has a very a fantastic ending with him escaping and, and just sort of wandering off. And you're like, oh, my God, you know, where's this going now? You know, it's sort of terrifying. And yet you sort of want him to get away as well, you know, and it's sort of um, so, no, I enjoy all of that stuff. And, and but um, the darker, the better for me. And I think when you said about um, Science Allowance, it's quite good because you're like, we do kind of want him to escape, even though it's a serial killer. And you're <laughs> like, should I be wishing for this? Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. It's, it's a bit like what you do in your books. You bring so much um, character to them that it's, as you say, they're an interesting character instead of this sort of bland hero, even the you know antagonists, the, the people we're supposed to dislike. There's something interesting about them. And I think you're quite a big fan of Thomas Harris' book as well, because Paul, as well as obviously the film, Paul has asked, do you read crime? Now, I'm assuming from what we've talked about already that that is something that you do. And I, I don't know, some authors go the complete opposite way and mm. want to read something different. But how about you? Yeah, no, I sort of, I do read quite a lot of crime. Um, it tends not to be modern authors, weirdly. I sort of, um, I'm quite old school, so I really love Thomas Harris and Patricia Highsmith's my favourite. I think she, you know, if you watch, you know, or read rather Strangers on a Train um, or The Talented Mr Ripley, and of course there have been great film versions of those as well. You know, I think her writing is just sort of special and I would love to get anywhere close to her quality. I think she's amazing. Um, but I do, I mean, I don't, I'm not a sort of crimeaholic. is that I do read, I do love to read history books. I love to read, I'm reading at the moment, I'm reading a biography of Stanley Kubrick because he, um, he, when he moved to England, he bought a, a house not far from where I live now and I often cycle past this grand mansion where I think, you know, uh, you know he plotted the shining and all that sort of stuff um and so i'm sort of quite interested in him so no i do i like to sort of vary it up a little bit but then you know it's a bit like you tend to go back to what is the thing that most excites you you know and for me it's always been thrillers and that sort of heart pounding thing you know and i don't mind reading comedies or stuff but i do quite like that sort of narrative tension that comes from from sort of high stakes high jeopardy and, and hopefully some sort of sinister antagonist lurking in the background 
Do you think, as um, a writer of all these amazing shows and your books, you've got a bit of an edge on the normal reader where you're like, do you know what, I figured it out. I know what's going on. <laughs> so, well, weirdly, less in books, more, more in TV. I think I find t- TV slightly easier to guess than books. I think sort of... But I, I guess it depends, really, what type of thing you're reading. Because, again, with sort of... The, like, the things that I write, there should be sort of multiple suspects. It really is quite hard to know. Or, or in something like Line of Duty, again, there's sort of lo- loads of sort of suspects... But a lot of modern books have been sort of um, domestic noir where, the, where there's really only one central question, like, is my husband the killer or not? You know, I sort of I enjoy those books, but I find them a little bit less sort of satisfying than the ones that really challenge you with. Right. It could be ABC. Do it. You know, and, and then you've really got to get your mind working. And those are ones that I enjoy the most. So you like the puzzle of trying, because I'm a big fan of that as well, like going, is it this person? In fact, at one point in your book, I went, yes! When <laughs> I was like, because I, I, I read a lot of crime myself, and I was like, is it, is it? I'm not sure, I'm not sure, maybe. And I was like, yes! Um, yeah. My husband found that quite amusing. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, absolutely, no, I, I like those ones. And I think, I mean, you go back to the classics of Agatha Christie or any of those things, like when you watch it now, and you're introduced to seven or eight characters, and, then, and there's your sort of cast. You think, well, you know, one of them's going to die and then it could be any of the others who, who are responsible. And I think, you know, you're forever picking up on tiny little visual clues or, or something that's said or whatever. And I think the real genius and what she was so good at is presenting all the facts to you and you still don't see it. Do you know what oh. I mean? And, and, you know, I reread Death on the Nile the other day and you think, wow, it's just, it's sort of, yeah, just such a clever twist and such a clever lie that she sold you that was sort of kind of obvious and yet you never thought about it you thought yeah. wow that is that's clever writing you know she knew what she was doing and she did in um murder or dracoid where it's like literally just yeah right, i'm not gonna say because yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but like right bang in front of you and you're like how did i miss that um yeah, and i i've lovely. read agatha christie multiple times as well yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm always trying to figure it out of, yeah. of what's happening and one of the things i absolutely loved about your book truth or dare is it was really complex i mean like really gripping and interesting and i was like what how Ah, uh, you know, like, and as I said, really felt for Helen was there's another body. What do you mean another body? <laughs> and, and, you know, like this rampage of crime. And obviously you obviously linked in like the dust cover that there might be a connection. So I was like, how could these things possibly be connected? So it was really wonderful as a reader to go on the same journey as Helen, trying to figure this out, trying to work out if they, you know, are they all completely individual crimes or are they all somehow intertwined and if they are intertwined why would these people be doing this and yeah. like like you talked about like the interest on the the normal person committing a crime and you've touched thankfully on the on the fact that you're writing the next book can you tell us anything about that about the next one um what i would say briefly on truth or dare is that i think it's narratively it's probably the most ambitious one i've done and um it's the only one I've ever done where I've actually had to write a diagram on the wall to try and oh, wow. to, to remind myself how all these things are connected because quite often it's one perpetrator who's killing you know and, and you slowly work out who it is this one because you've got multiple perpetrators multiple motives lots of weird and random connections um it was it was really quite complicated it's the most complicated one I've done but I did enjoy once you finally had the diagram in front of you like, right okay it all makes sense it all works out the, the lines all work which is partly where the the, the cover came from with the little uh, the sort of red string on the front. Um, in terms of what comes next, um, it's partly picking up on on the hook at the end of this one, um, which you've alluded to. Um, but it's also about um, th- this one was sort of I say truth or dare was very sort of uh, a big canvas. This is slightly more claustrophobic, and it's about people or a person invading people's homes and basically sort of, you know, taking the windows, climbing in, padding up the stairs. And it's sort of really about home invasion and, um, you know, the idea of someone violating your home, coming in um, and then butchering someone close to you. And it's uh, it's sort of quite unpleasant, but it's meant to, uh, what's the word? It, the whole overriding theme of it is paranoia. And, you know, if you're upstairs in bed, and you hear the floorboard creak downstairs or something. Is it just the wind or is there someone downstairs? And it's just that sort of 
at what point do you get out of bed and check or do you just stay there and hope and pull the covers over your head and hope for the best sort of thing so it's trying to get into that slightly sort of scary paranoid world which I'm quite enjoying at the moment that sounds really interesting. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and finally, I mean, our time's flown by, Matt. I just wanted to ask you, for you, what's one of the best things about being an author? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, um, partly it is playing God and creating these worlds and all these things and, and, and setting up all these red herrings. And I, I, I do enjoy that whole sort of creative side of it. And I think the thing that I've missed the most, which I enjoy because of COVID, is really is is all the events the book events meeting readers meeting fans and you know it's sort of the books have done well really well here and i've had some amazing events in in london and norfolk and um uh, sterling up, up with bloody scotland was great you know some really lovely events but also internationally the books have done incredibly well in 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 sort of north europe so france belgium holland and and that you know before covid i was going to amsterdam twice a year because the the dutch are such helen fans you know and and that was lovely. And it's just, you know, those are the things you miss is, is just going somewhere completely out of your normal sort of world. Like I went to Lisbon once for Lisbon Book Fair and turned up to my little stall thinking, oh, there probably won't be anyone there. That'll be a bit embarrassing, you know. And there was a queue of 100 people sort of. And you think, you know, that's so random that, that you know, <laughs> sort of 100 Portuguese fans would turn up and wait patiently in the hot sun to meet you and all the rest of it. And, and I think that's really what I miss because you just see people's, enthusiasm energy and just the weird thing that the character that you created and that you kind of love in a way people love too and they get very passionate about her and they want her to be okay and they want her to, you know mm. all this stuff and that sort of enthusiasm I think it's, it's a very different world to tv which I've worked in a lot which is great and and obviously has great enthusiasts but tv is a slightly more cynical world because there's so much money in it you know and the book publishing is slightly different I think and you know I've yet I've yet to meet a nasty person in, in publishing. Everyone who works in publishing seems lovely. All the readers seem lovely. And it's just a sort of love fest for people who love books and love the smell of books and the feel of books and the excitement of reading the first chapter and the sadness of getting to the end and all of those sort of things. And I just, it's just lovely being part of that world. And I really miss that. And I, you know, pray God that we can get back to yeah. some sort of interaction soon because it is, it's a lonely existence being a writer and it's nice to get out and meet people. And we've obviously been talking a lot today about Matt's latest book, Truth or Dare. And as I've already said, it, it really is brilliant. It's completely gripping. It's easily one of the best books I've read. As I've already said, it's due out on Thursday, which is the 24th. So do check it out. I don't think I could recommend it more. I've been telling everyone I know, read the book. Um, it's, it's brilliant. And I'd just like to finish by thanking everyone for joining us today. As a charity, we're always so grateful for your support. From attending events like this to borrowing our books, we're open. And, and donating to us. You can find out more about our services and ways to support us on our website. And to be the first to hear about all our upcoming um, events, do join our Facebook group, Discovery, which will be directed to when this event finishes. But our events also on our website and Eventbrite. So thank you all again for coming. And Matt, it's been such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for giving us the time today. Oh, thank you. It's been great fun. Thank you.